We are about to enter the fall feast season of the biblical Moedim, or appointed times, is the Hebrew word for it. Uh, there are seven total, and only seven, by the way. We've covered Judaism's leaven in the Hanukkah hoax and testing the book of Esther, from where the Purim false feast originates uh, from a false story that has never been scripture. We prove that. Even Martin Luther knew that and uh, exposed it in his day. Watch those and debate those over there, not here, or you will be muted. Our channel, our rules. This video is going to be incredible because this topic is incredible. The feast or the day of trumpets. Now we also cover who defiled the temple and that video is awesome as well uh, as we already covered uh, in this series the exiled temple priests kept the feasts. Messiah and all of the apostles kept the feasts, all seven of them, and read Rest, the Case for Sabbath, where we find even the early ecclesias in Turkey, the ones mentioned in Revelation as his ecclesia, yeah, some better than others, but doesn't matter. They're all mentioned. They're still keeping the same Bible Moedim, or appointed times, for centuries after that. And they even cite they were following the example of the apostles. So the apostles were doing it. Now, that book is free in ebook. You can read it at restsabbath.org. Today, it's time to celebrate, or at least prepare to do so, uh, we're releasing this at the beginning of the month. Uh, it's not till the 21st, but we're doing that so everyone has time to prepare. For very soon, we will enter the seventh Hebrew month. We're not there yet. And on the first day of that month, no, not by the moon, which fails for months coming in 10 days too soon, every year for those who follow it in error. We test that, by the way, in parts 6a through g of our Sabbath series, in which the feasts also apply uh, as they include special Sabbaths too, and there really is no separating the two. This year, and we follow the Zadok Way Qumran calendar, we'll leave a link for you in the description box, uh, it's pretty well done, by the way, those guys do a good job, generally, uh, it, we don't agree with all of it, but but it's good, it's, it's well done, and it generally matches what the temple priests were keeping still in the first century, including the Sabbath and the feast. Not Christmas, not Easter, never All Saints Day. Uh, these are all occult replacements for these actual feasts. Imagine that. They are counterfeits. In any church who can conduct even a little research to realize this very obvious position of Scripture, well, cannot be his ecclesia. His ecclesia is found in the last days in Revelation and Matthew 24 from Messiah keeping his commandments and Sabbath. They are not salvation, no, but they are signs of those who believe. In fact, Hebrews, that was written in the New Testament after Messiah ascended, uh, chapter 4, defines three times. Those who do not enter his Sabbath rest at that time, well after the cross, well after the resurrection and the ascension, well, the writer says, those operate in unbelief. They are not believers of the Bible. Ouch. That hit us hard and woke us up. And hopefully many of you will as well if you're not already. We know many of our viewers are. But true. And truth we need to hear. Again, we cover that in great detail uh, in Rest, the case for Sabbath. Check it out. Uh, it's right there in the introduction, in fact, to open up. We go right after it, proving that the Sabbath and the feasts are a bedrock of worship still in the New Testament after Messiah ascended. Imagine that. Any church changing this is changing the word, and again, is not as ecclesia, period. Can't be. Sorry, but we speak plain language here, and we do not placate stupid scholarship. Uh, especially scholars who can't even read. The day or Feast of Trumpets, which is Yom Teruah in Hebrew. By the way, it's never ever called Rosh Hashanah in Hebrew, ever in Scripture. Anyone doing so has no clue what they're talking about, uh, including every rabbi, every scholar, all of them who do so. 
Now, we'll cover that here as well in this video and show you in Scripture what we're talking about, and you'll see for yourself. Uh, we'll answer the question, does a shadow of heavenly things actually pass away? Hmm, that's interesting. Uh, how can it? <laughs> Think about it. Uh, what the modern church is saying is truly hypocrisy, and again, they're not even thinking. But celebrate the occult days and abandon the biblical, because, because why, Pastor? Please tell me why we should abandon the Bible. Why can, I mean, how can any pastor ever have such a position? There is no coherent answer to that question from any pastor anywhere at any time. We've never heard one. Uh, we'll also answer, do we use the shofar or ram's horn, uh, or can we use modern trumpets uh, made of brass and other metals? Scripture tells us, it's pretty simple. This is the first day of the seventh Hebrew month. Now, that does not coincide with the Roman calendar, which is way off. So anyone's trying to do that, it's not going to make sense, but you just got to keep that straight and understand that's the case. However, Zadok Way reconciled this pretty well uh, based on the Qumran calendar that exists. We have that calendar. Uh, it's in the, uh, the complete Dead Sea Scrolls uh, by Giza Verms and others. Uh, we don't know that this is 100% perfect. Okay, so this date, it, it, it may not be 100%, but it's pretty good. The point is, even if you have a different date, do what Paul said. Yes, Paul said it. Keep the feast. Do what Luke said. Keep the feast. And he even said, I must keep the feast. That's what Luke said, emphatically. Yeah, Paul said that, and the church doesn't even know it because they take his words out of context in fragments, and he wrote in large concepts, never in sound bites. You can't read him that way and ever understand what he says. We'll talk about the observance of this day and this year. It falls on September 21st, beginning at sunrise, we also prove. And our hope is many things will be cleared up in this video, we hope. Uh, if you are watching this another year other than 2022, because we're going to leave this up, of course, uh, the date changes, so it's not going to be September 21st necessarily, uh, and we will release the dates each year. But you can always go to Zadok Way's Qumran calendar. You can just search Google for that and find it pretty easy, and we'll leave you a link in the description box for that. But the date changes on a Roman calendar each year, though it never changes on the Hebrew calendar. It's always the same day every year. We just are in two different calendars, that's all. Uh, we will always remind you of the days each year. Right now, uh, again, we're using the Zadok Way calendar, Qumran calendar, uh, which we like. Uh, we do not have one of our own. We haven't released one, and we don't plan to until uh, we complete research where we feel like we could. And we're not there yet. So let's get started. Here we go. Let's go to the book of Numbers 29, verse 1. And in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, there you go, seventh Hebrew month, not, not, not July, seventh Hebrew month, which actually coincides with the end of September this year. Uh, on the first day of the seventh Hebrew month, not the new moon, by the way, but the new month, the first day of it. Notice we are in the seventh Hebrew month here, not the first month, so it cannot be the head of the year, duh, uh, which is what Rosh Hashanah means, uh, head of the ha Shana year. Uh, we'll cover that a little more in this video. Only two Babylonians who follow the moon in worship and error, which is Phariseeism, uh, or modern Judaism, uh, they say so themselves. Just read the Jewish Encyclopedia. It's right there. Look up Pharisee. Um, Messianic, all the same, by the way. They just added leaven to the New Testament as well in that movement. Uh, so it's actually worse. Ye shall have an holy convocation. So that's a gathering. Uh, now many celebrate this the entire day. Uh, together, which is appropriate and a beautiful thing. Wonderful. Do that if you can. Uh, and they end with a feast. 
Uh, you shall do no servile work. Now, so this is a Sabbath, just like the weekly one, but as this is a feast, Sabbath, a food Sabbath, food preparation is allowed. After all, it is a feast, right? It is a day of blowing the trumpets unto you. Now, why? Wait till you see the reason for this is a prophetic event to come. FYI, that means it can't pass away before it even comes, right? Think about it, Pastor. Come on, you can do this. And ye shall offer a burnt offering for a sweet savor unto Yahuwah, one bullock, one ram, and seven lambs. This detail doesn't matter. I'm going to tell you why. Don't worry. We'll get there. Uh, without blemish. This detail doesn't matter because Messiah's already fulfilled our sacrifice. He is our sacrifice for all feasts and all Sabbaths forever. Does the sacrifice pass away? Does he? Uh, he's still in heaven. He's still alive. Hello. He didn't pass away. So he didn't pass away. The sacrifice doesn't pass away. He only needed to offer sacrifice one time, and that is sufficient forever. Animal sacrifices are no longer sufficient, nor will they ever be. The sacrifice didn't pass away, however. He conquered death and remains our atonement for sin. And we should keep the feast to commemorate that every year, the seven times a year, and the 52 Sabbaths as well. All of them. They all commemorate him. Now this continues to talk about preparing the burnt offering, which we're going to skip because we no longer do that. No, it didn't pass away. Again, he's still alive. We'll show you, uh, again, that in Scripture. Verse 6, Beside the burnt offering of the month and his meat offering, okay, and the daily burnt offering and his meat offering, and their drink offerings according unto their manner, for a sweet savor, a sacrifice made by fire unto Yahuwah. What's this talking about? No more meat offerings again. We're, we're going to show you the scripture. However, we can still execute spice or incense offerings, such as frankincense, myrrh, and other biblical spices. Uh, very easy to get. We'll talk about that a little. Uh, Yahuwah still loves the smell, and that is an acceptable sacrifice even still. That never changed. Also, drink offerings, really of wine, pretty simple. This is very easy stuff to do. Uh, you can execute this uh, yourself, and we'll go through this a little bit. Uh, let's continue. Hebrews, uh, that's in the New Testament, by the way, just, just, just so you know, it's, it's in the New Testament, defines why Yahushua Messiah is our perfect sacrifice regarding the meat offering, and this is no longer adequate as uh, an animal sacrifice. No animal sacrifice can compare forever. It's just not needed. It doesn't mean it passes away. Yahushua doesn't pass away. He's still alive. Some will claim there, after the Day of Judgment, animal sacrifices will resume. No, they won't. That is illiterate to Scripture. It never happens. That's Judaism and its fraudulent doctrine at best. Uh, there is no instance in which animals will measure up to the sacrifice of Messiah. Let's read Hebrews 10.1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come. Well, did, did, did you read that? If the law is a shadow in part of things to come, then it cannot pass away before those things even come. Can it? Of course not. And not the very image of the things, right? A shadow. The origin is heaven here. And last we checked, that's still there, right? Can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So again, animal sacrifices are insufficient, always have been, uh, but at least they were a good measure before Yahushua came. Now that Yahushua has come, there is no need for them. Yahushua is our sacrifice. He remains our sacrifice. That never changes. This is criticizing the Pharisees in the temple because, see, they usurp the priesthood uh, and the temple, for that matter. They are illegitimate and not even Hebrews because they still sacrificed animals 
until the temple was destroyed, all in vain from the day that Yahusha rose from the dead. They had no clue what they were doing. And of course, they hated him and still do. Um, so they would do the sacrifice uh, and it made theirs useless. It was rejected, but theirs is rejected anyway because they profane everything they touch. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Good question. Because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. In other words, when Yahushua forgives sin, he casts it as far as the east is from the west. Those two don't meet. Okay, so there's, there's no remembrance of sins at that point when he forgives. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance, again, made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. They're not Yahusha. There was nothing wrong with this ritual, but before Yahusha, now that he's here, we don't need them. He came and fulfilled the sacrifice, meaning he executed it. It doesn't pass away after he fulfills it. That is ridiculous. Never in the definition of the word fulfill. He was the sacrifice. He didn't pass away. Did he? Uh, no. See, the English word fulfill never means passed away. You'll never find that in its definition. Uh, it means he kept it. He kept the law. He kept the Sabbath. He kept the feast. He did not break them. He could not break them. He definitely didn't break them because the Bible says he didn't sin. And if he broke them, he broke the law. Therefore, he was lawless. Therefore, he sinned. And that's what the church says. The church says Yahushua was a sinner. That's what it says. And there are many are saying it every week from the pulpit, and it is the most illiterate occult doctrine one could ever represent. So, fulfill is not pass away. For instance, if you order two TVs from a company and they fulfill your order, well, does that mean that there are no more TVs? I mean, TVs passed away, and you better get your money back because evidently they change the English language in seminaries very stupidly. So your TVs disappear too. There are no more TVs because yours were fulfilled. Illiterate. That is not a definition of the word fulfill. They pass away once delivered. Nonsense. That is the most illiterate definition we have ever heard. And yet, that's what you get from most pulpits, even written in denominational church doctrine and taught in seminaries, and it's utterly stupid. It always has been. Skip to verse 8, but read it all. This is a YouTube video. We can't cover every word of every verse or of every uh, passage. I wish we could, but we can't. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not... Neither has pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. So even though they're offered by the law, even though they're lawful in, in the law of Moses, which law remains, Yahushua replaced the sacrifice. He did not replace the day. He did not replace the practice. His sacrifice was one time and forever. Yahushua was a mirror of Yahuwah in all things. He kept or fulfilled the law in every letter of it, just as he said, Matthew 5, 17 through 20, the law will be fulfilled until the day of judgment, which has not happened yet. So this is an event to come, and keeping the law is still a shadow of that. How can churches frame it passed away? Only in fraud, my friends, even frauding the word fulfill in definition, and that is pathetic. Which are offered by the law. Then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O Elohim. Okay? That's why Yahushua came. He did what he saw the Father do. He taketh away the first sacrifice. That's the topic here. Uh, but... Does it pass away then? No. Ridiculous. That he may establish the second. Now he is the sacrifice and the establishment of such institution forever. And it never ends. And to say so says that Yahushua passed away. That's what you have to say. It's the only way to do that. 
by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Yahushua Messiah once for all. So once and for all. Got that? He settled it. There is no debate. Yahushua is the sacrifice once and for all, which means he still is part of every biblical feast or Moedim and every Sabbath. Those are the times you sacrifice in the Bible, by the way. Abraham knew that. Noah knew that. Adam knew that. Even Cain and Abel knew to sacrifice in what appears to be a first fruits offering. So 59 times per year, in fact, uh, he is it. There is no other sacrifice which measures up, and we don't go backwards, to his, and his was a one-time, covers-all event, period. And that's the way scripture reads. I mean, it tells us this many times. But the very fact that Yahushua remains the sacrifice once and for all means we keep these Moedim. How can we not? These appointed times of the Bible and not hypocritically occult feasts in their place. I mean, the pastors ridicule Yahushua's feast in which he is literally a part of and they will hypocritically tell us well, you, you, those feasts in the Bible, they, they passed away. So you don't keep them anymore. You're, you're not supposed to. Don't you dare keep them anymore. But, oh, no, no, instead, here, here's these. Here you go. Here's, here's a nice holiday for you, wrapped in a bow. Each one of occult origins. Disgusting. We can't imagine anything more hypocritical than that. And that comes from our pulpits today. This is the defining issue of our day when the remnant ecclesia restores his way and takes a stand. His Sabbath, his feasts, his commandments, of which Yahushua taught all ten, Paul taught all ten, and you find them even in Revelation as well in the end. Verse 11, And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Now, he's not ridiculing the Old Testament here. That is ridiculous. This is a rebuke of Pharisees. That's who's in the temple at that time. They usurped the priesthood. They stole the temple. And they were still practicing animal sacrifices, even though Yahushua was our sacrifice. The biblical ecclesia was not. They are the ones still standing in the temple, still offering profane sacrifices of animals at that point up until when it was destroyed. The only thing that changed when the temple was destroyed in about 70 AD is they changed the name of their religion from essentially Phariseeism to Rabbinic Judaism. Now, that's according to the Jewish Encyclopedia. That's what they say, so they admit it. Um, and modern rabbis are the same rabbis. They, they were Pharisees in the first century, and they're still Pharisees today. No difference. They would still be doing animal sacrifices if they had the temple, and for no reason. Uh, in fact, the temple doesn't even serve a purpose, wouldn't, wouldn't. And a third temple is going to be built, even according to Scripture, it does say that it will, but that will be for the beast. That will not be Yahuwah's temple. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, got that? It only took one. It cannot pass away because it is forever. See? His sacrifice remains as it is forever. That's Hebrews. That's what Hebrews says. That's in the New Testament, last I checked. So, if your New Testament church doesn't, it ain't about the New Testament. It's making up its own. It doesn't even know the New Testament. Sat down on the right hand of Elohim, yes, Yahushua did, Messiah, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool, for by one offering, one, he hath perfected forever. Did you hear that? Forever. Forever doesn't pass away, folks. Forever them that are sanctified. And that's us. I hope, right? Each of us who's listening, uh, most of our viewers are definitely following along. Again, why would uh, he offer himself again when he didn't need to? 
Just in one event, one sacrifice, Yahushua was able to perfect the sanctification. That's what this is all about. That's what the sacrifice was all about. For all 59 sacrifices, for all the feasts and Sabbaths, for every year, forever done the end. And again, forever doesn't pass away. Again, that doesn't indicate something passing away, as to do so would be to forget what he did. And that's ludicrous in practice, though that's what the church is doing. They think they're remembering what Yahushua did. No, they're not at all. We keep his feasts. That's how you remember. You keep the remembrance of his feast. You also remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Wow. Now, that's the way it works. We remember his sacrifice, and we do it 59 times of the year, essentially. Uh, we do his commandments. We don't forget them and marginalize and ridicule them and those that keep them because we wish, and pastors do in their own words, to be lawless or sin. That's what James defines as lawlessness is sin. And churches are founded on lawlessness largely today in their own basic doctrines. And that is so sad, and I wish I couldn't say that. I really do. But the time we live in, we live in a strong delusion indeed. This is how the lambs are led to slaughter in our time. It is important that we keep his feasts and we stop keeping Christmas and Easter and these ridiculous occult, uh, nonsensical uh, pagan replacements and counterfeits. But many are awakening, there's no doubt, in this age. The remnant ecclesia is rising. So, does the shadow of heavenly things to come, think about the wording there, that's what the Bible says, uh, you, you know, that have not come yet, does it pass away? before they even come? I mean, what a ridiculous notion. I mean, just think about the question. It, it's like hey, anybody can look at that and say, well, no, of course not. Yet, this is church doctrine for most. It is. See the popsicle on the screen, right? Uh, it's there, right? You, you can see that. Uh, you can see it casts a shadow, right? Now, once it casts the shadow, does it disappear? Does it pass away? Well, no, it's still there, casting the shadow. And the shadow is still there because it's still there. If you take it away, no shadow, right? If it's still there, the shadow is still there. Ha! Ah. It's not a shadow, a reflection of an original image, isn't it? I mean, of course it is. Uh, in this case, let's look at Scripture. We saw one already that told us these things, the feasts, the Sabbaths, are a shadow of heavenly things to come. We'll show you some more. Thus, if those heavenly things still cast a shadow, it means they are still there too. Are they not? They cannot pass away. And you know better because we see their shadow. That is especially what the fall feasts are. Think about it one last time. When we see your shadow, you're walking down the street, there's your shadow behind you. Do you then disappear? I mean, I know that works for Peter Pan, but that's fiction, right? So how exactly can heaven pass away before it passes away? Because that's what the church is saying. Nonsense. Or is made new, of course, on the Day of Judgment. That's when it passes away. It's made new. It's replenished. Uh, that didn't happen yet, though. Therefore, its shadow cannot pass away either until it does. There you go. Now, Matthew 5, 17 through 20 nails that. We've covered that in many videos uh, and in this series. So go read it if you haven't. Uh, but that tells you exactly how this works. The law doesn't pass. Not one letter of it says Yahusha. And we says, until all things be fulfilled, the word fulfilled doesn't mean pass away either. Never. So Messiah promises not one letter of the law. That's the law of Moses. 
That's what was in place when he said it. The one written by the very finger of Yahuwah, yet some say it could pass away. What? Yahuwah wrote something that passes away? What? That's nonsense. Uh, in part, of course. But will pass away when? Not until the day of judgment. And again, that's really just a benchmark. It continues forever. It's still here, folks. That's the point that Messiah makes there. Uh, we better restore his feasts and abandon these occult counterfeits meant to lead us to hell. Salvation is relationship, according to Yahusha in Matthew five or Matthew seven and John fifteen, among other places. If we aren't in relationship with Him, no, the Sabbath, the feasts, they're not salvation. They're signs of one who is saved. But if we're not in relationship with Him, He told us, He will tell us to depart. Hebrews 8, 4. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. Still talking about sacrifices there. Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of Elohim when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. This pattern is the heavenly pattern, and it is what casts a shadow in the feasts and Sabbath that we keep on earth, as well as the law. They are a foreshadowing until the day of judgment. Neither can pass, and neither has. Chapter 10, verse 1. We already read earlier uh, a shadow of good things to come. Uh, and chapter 9, verse 11, But Messiah being come and high priest of good things to come, still following the heavenly example. As long as heaven is there, its practices of good things to come and its shadow remains. To say otherwise for any pastor is to say that they think Heaven is no longer there. That they think Yahusha is no longer there. And they're wrong and hypocrites on that point. By a greater and more perfect tabernacle, that's Yahusha's body, was more perfect than the tabernacle and even the temple. And that was his point. And he made that clear uh, that our bodies are the temple uh, as well in Scripture. Not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. So it's nothing to do with buildings. The ecclesia is not about building churches. It's not about building buildings. There's whole huge organizations out there. That's what they do. They go around just building buildings. All useless. All will be destroyed on the day of judgment, consumed with eternal fire, just like every other profane thing on earth. Get that. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, because he only had to do it once, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Now, what part of eternal do scholars not understand? Eternal doesn't pass away. Forever doesn't pass away. He need not make a sacrifice again in this vein. It is finished. Not all his works. Not in the slightest, as to say so is to forget what he does on the day of judgment, especially which far overshadows what he did on the cross. Don't wish to demean that. That was important, but his greatest work is to come. It is nice the churches say from the pulpit that he finished his work at the cross, but that is a lie and it always has been very wrong. Now let's go right to Paul, who supposedly, well, abolished the feast that he actually kept, so the church calls him a hypocrite, that's pretty illiterate, um, who supposedly abolished the Sabbath, yet he kept it, supposedly abolished circumcision, yet after that he actually circumcised Silas himself, practicing it, thus didn't abolish it. I mean, these are not sensical church positions, every single one of them. They are not reading the Bible. This one, though, is royally screwed up in the church. Colossians 2.16. Let's just go right forward here. 
Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of unholy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. So in other words, did Paul just say, uh, don't keep the Sabbath or holy days, throw them out? Now that we hear all the time, and it is the dumbest lie we've ever heard. They can't even read. Paul is talking about and specifies in full context. Read it. Read it all. He addresses the Pharisees from the beginning of this chapter, who are the ones judging the ecclesia. That's who he was dealing with. How do we not know that? How do we forget after all of the encounters, encounters that Yahushua had with the Pharisees that the Pharisees were still there? Amazing. They're the ones judging the ecclesia. They're the ones judging Messiah, claiming he broke the Sabbath when he answers them and the church doesn't even know his answer. They only read what the Pharisees accuse. And the church takes the Pharisee position of accusation. How about that? Now, basically, he addresses the Pharisees who are the ones judging the ecclesia, who keep the biblical calendar and days, which are not the Pharisee one, which is very clear in the account of Yahushua's death and resurrection. Uh, one which is error every Sabbath, Every feast, they profane them all. They do, well, everything they do is false worship anyway, but they even change the time of all of them. So the dates are wrong, uh, or at least the time of day is wrong in every feast and every Sabbath, every time, every year in modern Judaism. Not sure how so many pastors forgot the many rebukes of Yahushua regarding the Pharisees. It's as if they want to be the blind, led by the blind. Well, that's what Yahushua said. That's his quote uh, about the Pharisees being the blind, leading the blind. Which the modern church certainly fits, unfortunately, because they follow Pharisees over the Bible. Pharisees are doing the judging of the Sabbath and feast days because the ecclesia does not match them right? I mean, that whole circumcision thing was them going around telling people who had just gotten saved, oh, now you have to be circumcised. I know you're an adult male of 53 years old, but you have to be circumcised now. Ouch! Uh, you talk about putting a stumbling block in front of people. And Paul never made the decision regarding that doctrine. He goes to Jerusalem. He talks to the apostles, the leadership at the time. They tell him to go back and tell the Gentiles, you know what? If you haven't been circumcised by the age of 53, it's okay. It's supposed to be done at eight days old. You realize that, right? I mean, he didn't go back and say eight-day-old males no longer need to be circumcised. He was talking to Gentile adult males. Wow. This really isn't that difficult. I don't know why the church can't keep these things in context. Paul kept the feast. Uh is is essentially that i mean would this not phrase your church your pastor as a pharisee yes it would why then is he taking the pharisee position and accusations against yahushua when messiah even answers these ridiculous charges and puts them in their place and he does many times we cover that and rest the case for sabbath in great detail it's like they don't even read his answer I mean, I don't get why they would do that, but it seems like they don't. Uh, but just take the side of illiterate Pharisees uh, in ridicule. It's very sad. So what does Paul then specify? Well, the same doctrine of Yahushua. What are these feasts and Sabbaths to Paul? Not sure how any pastor can miss this. Which are a shadow of things to come. What? Well, th that means they haven't come yet. And that means they haven't passed away. Oops. I, how do we not realize that's what Paul said? But the body is of Messiah because he is our perfect sacrifice. Wow. However, these Moedim remain a shadow of things to come in Paul's time. Therefore, they haven't passed away. See, the Moedim are and they remain as long as heaven remains, actually. Uh, then he says this. Now, this is directly to our pastors and seminaries and scholars who seem to be unable to read Scripture. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. By the way, you do realize that when you're 
worshiping on pagan holidays like Christmas and Easter. You are worshiping the Nephilim and Watcher Fallen Angel paradigm. That's what he's talking about there. It's Watcher Fallen Angel doctrine. It's not Bible. Worshipping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. And by the way, you never will see a fallen angel. You won't. Uh, because the watchers are locked away and you'll never see them. They're never released. I know there's books out there that say that, but they're lying to you because they can't even read Enoch because he says they stay in the prison where they're at and the angels go to them walk them down the, the aisle, the street, to the other part, the other block, whatever, and throw them into the lake of fire. That's it. They never escape. Paul then rebukes the very Pharisees and their position. The church takes this Pharisee position. Today, trying to use Paul's words out of context, he kept the feast and he followed the example of Yahusha. He had to, or he was no apostle. Yahushua says the same in Matthew 24, 29, where he also defines exactly what the day of or feast of trumpets, Yom Teruah in Hebrew, represents in the end, what it is a shadow of which is to come. That means it's prophetic. It's something that's going to happen. And here is the happening right here. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, now we all know what that means, right? Well, uh, those that are pre-trib rapture better read because it happens immediately after the tribulation of those days, after the great tribulation even goes on to uh, specify in this same passage. Watch our three rapture videos. So immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened. This, this is a timestamp. We know that happens at the very end. Okay, that's there in Revelation. And the moon shall not give her light. That's there in Revelation. The star shall fall from heaven. That's there in Revelation. Uh, that happens toward the end of the Great Tribulation. And the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Now, I know the church uses this as the base scripture for the pre-trib rapture. But again, they, they can't even read that Yahushua just told you when the rapture happens on the Day of Judgment at the end of the Great Tribulation. He even tells them the sun and moon are gone. And, I mean, you can read Revelation. You can see when that happens at the end of the Great Tribulation, the very end. Also, this defines the timeline here. Trumpets is a shadow of this event. This is incredible. I mean, why wouldn't we keep this feast? Why wouldn't we celebrate the coming of the second coming of Messiah? I mean, we talk about it in church, and then we don't keep the feast that celebrates it. Wow. And again, this hasn't happened yet. The event is still to come. The Feast of Trumpets is still a shadow of that event that hasn't happened yet. And that shadow, that feast, remains and cannot pass away because the original is still there in heaven. Yahushua is alive. There is no other way to view this, period. Scripture is not written by inept, floundering, spineless scholars. Thank Yahuwah. There is no such thing as flexible theology. Oh, well, you know, I, I interpret it that way. I interpret it this way. I, oh, there's one interpretation. The Bible is one. That doesn't mean that we always get it right on everything. But you know what? When we prove things out, we test them, and we prove it. We ain't perfect, but when we prove, we prove. Scholarship stopped proving centuries ago. Not sure if they ever really did, reading a lot of the trash that's out there. Uh, it is a Pharisee paradigm and function, really, which is why it looks like it and acts like it. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Now that's when we meet him in the air on the day of judgment and never before. Watch our three rapture videos. You will never debate it. But if you want to try, do it over there. Not here, our channel, our rules. No debate in ignorance. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great 
glory. The second coming on the day of judgment and not possibly before. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. That's the feast of trumpets. That's the day of trumpets, folks. Yom Teruah. And that is what we commemorate in this feast. And it hasn't happened yet. This is the origin that casts the shadow into our age backwards. Still, as it has not happened yet, that we still keep, or we are in rebellion if we don't. That's the way Scripture works. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. What a scripture. Let's go back to Paul, who well knew this stuff, and anyone who says otherwise, well, simply can't read. Uh, they're reading him in fragments. That's why they take him out of context, just as Peter said. Uh, they were doing 2,000 years ago. That's, that is Pharisee. And the modern church acts like them much of the time, sadly. 1 Corinthians 15.50 now, this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of Elohim. Now, we all receive new bodies before we enter, but we enter, that this is all about our spirits, right? Um, Neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. Our flesh is corrupt. Our current bodies are corrupt, no matter who you are. Only Yahushua had no sin. Romans 3.23 is very clear. All the rest of us fall short. All of us have sinned. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Well, wait a minute. What, 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 what's Paul talking about? Well, when we die, our spirits sleep. They rest in the earth, in chambers. That's what Enoch says. That's what Paul says. That's what Yahushua says several times. Uh, it's there all over Scripture. Watch. Where do we go when we die? Uh, but some will be alive at the end of the Great Tribulation, okay? So we shall not all sleep because they're alive, and they're just going to go right up into the air, but they're going to leave their bodies. They're going to shed their skin. That's the way that works. But we shall all be changed. See, there you go. We're going to shed our existing bodies. We're going to receive new ones, all a part of the process here, during the Day of Judgment, which is really a period probably of about three weeks of the Fall Feast. All three of the Fall Feasts are all about the Day of Judgment. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, that is the day, the Feast of Trumpets, my friends. That is what happens on the future good day to come in which this Feast of Trumpets is a shadow of or a foreshadow, really. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed on the feast of trumpets, which remains. And why on earth wouldn't every church on the face of the earth be keeping this now? You cannot get more New Testament than this feast of trumpets. Wow. Let's go to Revelation 8, 2. Now, this is future. And I saw the seven angels which stood before Elohim, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censure. And there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. Now, we continued on there, uh, but we, I did that because I want to show you there's the spice offerings as a part of the Feast of Trumpets. It's right there. Uh, that is still occurring even at the end of uh, you know Revelation. It's right there, <laughs> so you can't really miss it. Uh, we added that part so you could see it, even though I don't think it's on screen. Read it for yourself, though. Then let's go to verse 6. And the seven angels, which had the seven trumpets, prepared themselves to sound, and that is the event for which the feast, or day of trumpets, is a shadow, or really foreshadow, 
of. That is the good day to come, and it hasn't happened yet. Thus, the Feast of Trumpets, the shadow we still practice until that point, and even after, it remains, and it cannot pass away. Now, which is it that we practice here? Uh, do we blow trumpets? like the ones made out of brass or silver or other metals, as we see today? Or do we have to blow the shofar, the ram's horn? Well, Scripture's clear on this. It actually addresses this, and we will uh, see a whole lot of people trying to force something that is really not there in Scripture because of the Pharisees, really following the Pharisee practice. Uh, it's certainly okay to do it still, uh, because it still qualifies as a trumpet, but it is not necessary. Check this out. Let's go to Numbers 10, 1. And Yahuwah spake unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver. Oh, wait, they had trumpets of silver back then? You mean Israel actually had trumpets, not just ram's horns? Indeed. And which did they use? Well, both, actually. Uh, either are fine. It doesn't matter. However, the modern one is just fine. Uh, you do not have to blow a ram's horn uh, in order for uh, this to work. That's not actually part of this feast. doesn't have to be. It can be. It's fine. It's a nice nostalgic way to do it. It's the very ancient way, no doubt. Uh, but that is an archaic instrument, uh, which is very difficult. And pretty smelly, actually, <laughs> um, if you've ever blown one directly. Uh, if you do use one, uh, which you can, there's no problem with that. Uh, it won't make a great sound, but it, you can get it to make sound. A trumpet would be far better, a, a real trumpet. Uh, but we encourage you to use a trumpet mouthpiece if you do. Uh, there is no edict that you must use a ram's horn here. Uh, though, if you wish, have at it. No problem. Uh, it is the m most ancient of trumpets. There's no doubting that. Of a whole piece shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. Now, this is uh, especially for war, assembling the people. But Moses is going to tell us, it's also for the feast. So I'm going to read a little further here so we know. And when they shall blow with them all the assembly, shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So it's how they, I, I, I guess, you know, you remember the, uh, in, in uh, the Wild West, you know, ages, uh, the early 1900s or so, 1800s, uh, you know, they would ring the church bell and everybody would come, you know, that's basically uh, in Israel, they blew the trumpet, the silver trumpets, not the ram's horn, in order to do that at this point. Um, so, uh, and if they blow, but with one trumpet, then the princes, which are heads of the thousands of Israel, shall gather themselves unto thee. So they knew that it had different ones for different purposes. But this is what we want to get to. Skip to verse 8, but read it all, of course. Uh, again, this is a YouTube channel. We can't cover everything, everything. Uh, we cover a lot of scripture. And the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow with the trumpets. Now, that's the Levites, uh, the sons of Zadok from the time of the temple, from the time of Solomon, were the specific family within the Levites uh, with such charge. But the Levites were the musicians and the singers as well. They led the temple worship and were the temple priest. They were not Pharisees, not a single one of them. Pharisees usurped the priesthood and stole the temple in 165 BC, which is why Yahusha launched his ministry where the temple priests were exiled in Qumran, which is Bethabara in scripture, where he was baptized, not at the Jerusalem temple, which was sitting there defiled already. And they shall be to you for an ordinance forever throughout your generations. Everybody understands what that means, right? Uh, forever. I know. Oh, no, it's just to, that's just to the Jews. Wrong. It says the same law will be for you, the native born and the stranger among you, the Gentiles. And that's there many times we've covered that before. 
And if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresses you, then you shall blow an alarm with the trumpet, so they have a purpose there, uh, and ye shall be remembered before Yahuwah your Elohim. So Yahuwah hears those trumpets, understand. Uh, yes, that is his name there, not Lord, by the way. And ye shall be saved from your enemies. Also, in the day of your gladness and in your solemn days. Now, that Hebrew word there is moedim. It is the holy days, the feasts. That's what it is. And in the beginnings of your months, yes, on the first day of each month. Uh, in fact, uh, David, uh, you know, uh, there's a passage in Psalm showing that he uh, kept the feast uh, the first of each month. Uh, there's a, actually even King Saul did, uh, and David missed one of them one time. Uh, so that is there. That was a practice. They're not feast feasts, but uh, it is. there's nothing wrong with practicing it. Notice, however, not months. I mean, not moons. The word there's not moon, it's month. There's a difference. Now, we're going to cover that a little bit here, too. Uh, can't do it justice in this one video, but we'll deal with it a little. So, in the beginning of your months, uh, so the moon cycle does not match that of the biblical month. Never works. The biblical month is 30 days with one intercalary day added at the end of each quarter for a total of 364 years. Uh, if you follow the moon, you're 10 days too soon, 354. It doesn't work. That's why the Book of Jubilees calls it error, and that's why Enoch calls it error and defines the sun every day of the sun of the year, 364 days, all of it. Enoch is very specific. You shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings. When do you do that? Well, that is specifically the feasts and Sabbaths especially that they may be to you for a memorial before your Elohim. I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. So, Yahuwah said, use silver or metal trumpets now. That's what he said. It's okay, and it's okay for you 2,000 years or more later, uh, even still. Actually, we're about almost 4,000 years later now. So, uh, let them have their fun, uh, especially the children. Uh, do so with discipline, of course. Uh, do things decently in order, but uh, you know, not during scripture reading, prayer, worship, etc. But you know what? Yahuwah enjoys it. Get them the plastic trumpets and let them have at it for a one day a year. And only one. You don't have to do it anymore. <laughs> then take that trumpet away if you want. You don't have to tolerate it. But for one day, let's teach our children to enjoy this day. And all of these feasts, because this will entrench this, uh, they, they, they will look forward to these feasts for the rest of their lives. You know, Christmas is nothing compared to trumpets and the coming tabernacles, which we'll cover in another video, uh, which is even far more fun, especially for children. No amount of blowing is too much, in an orderly fashion, of course, control it, but this is the ultimate celebration again, foreshadowing the second coming of Messiah. You cannot get any better than that, and you can't get any more New Testament than that. So if you are a New Testament church, you better be keeping this feast. This is what we long for and celebrate on this day. Okay, many get confused by mistranslations where scholars have confused everyone on the word moon and the word month, which are two different Hebrew words, yet they really mess up the translation. So which is it here? Is it the first day of the month or is it supposed to be the new moon? Let's look at it. We already read Numbers, and here's the same account of the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah. That's the Hebrew. That's the word. Uh, never Rosh Hashanah. In Leviticus 23, 24, both tell us this is to be observed on the first day of the seventh Hebrew month, period. Now, that is not 
our first day of September, for instance, understand that the Roman calendar is far off. So it has to be reconciled, uh, which is why the day changes each year through the uh, through the, the Roman calendar year, but it is the same day each year on the Hebrew calendar and actually never changes. There's no leap year in the Hebrew calendar. Not the real one, no. no it, the the uh, Jews need it for their fraudulent calendar because it's a Babylonian monstrosity uh, that never works, and they come in 10 days too soon, so they have to have leap years and they have to make adjustments uh, because their calendar is pretty illiterate. Notice, though, the Hebrew here in the bottom right, the first day, Ahad, of the month, Hodas, uh, that is the word for month in Hebrew. It is not the word for moon. Many times translators err when they put in there moon for the word Hodas, which is never the moon, it is the month. This messes up a whole lot, and in time, we will rectify this throughout Scripture. At least we, we hope to get to that. That's one of those projects we wish to complete, uh, but we're talking about hundreds of references. So it's the first day of the month, not based on the moon whatsoever, uh, because the Bible calendar, well, begins with the sun. It's sunrise, never the moon. Uh, Watch our Sabbath series, parts 6a through g, and for those saying, oh, but wait a minute, there's two feast days that start uh, at sundown. Yes, there are, and both of them prove the day starts at sunrise by their very calendar dates. Watch Answers on Sabbath, parts 1 and 2. Some say, oh, but in creation there was darkness first. No. In creation, day one of creation, Yahuwah created Light, Elohim created light, and he called it day, not night. Then he separated it from the night. The night is second. This is so blatantly obvious and very, very messed up in modern Judaism especially. When Moses means the month, he uses a different Hebrew word. Here it is. The sun, moon, and stars you see in this passage. The word for moon is Yaria. That's a different Hebrew word. In ancient Hebrew, by the way, there's no CH. It's just H. Uh, the Chach. Who knows where that comes from? It sounds like something from Slavic languages, which would make sense because it's Yiddish in pronunciation. Uh, likely never actually Hebrew. But that's a different Hebrew word from the word for month, which is Hodas. Uh, again, they have screwed it up so badly, one has to go through and verify uh, what Hebrew uh, word is used each time it's used. And that's sad, but it's true. The Hebrew month is never based on the moon, can't be, because it doesn't work. Uh, it has a 29 and a half day cycle, not 30, and that's why it's 10 days off every year. Uh, and that's 10 days behind every year. So it's 50 days off uh, every every five years. Uh, it's, you know, 100 days off every uh, 10 years, and so on and so forth. Jubilees and Enoch both tell us uh, to follow the moon. For days, weeks, months, years, Sabbaths of years, and even Jubilees of years is error in all cases. Now we can't end this video without addressing this. You have all heard this feast day, and you're hearing it even now, called Rosh Hashanah. Well, in Hebrew, this is the head, Rosh, of the Ha year, Shana. Shana. Okay, now, wait. However, there is never an instance where the Bible moved its calendar from its start in the spring in the month of Abib, the first month. That's why it's called first, because it's the first month. And we're now in the seventh month because it's, well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven months later, hello, um, <laughs> to all of a sudden start the, the new year in the fall. That is nonsense in Scripture. It is Babylonian. It is not Hebrew. Here is the only time the Bible ever uses the phrase in Hebrew, Rosh Hashanah. 
uh, and it refers to Abib 10. Abib is the head or beginning of the year. That's the first month. The seventh month in which the Feast of Trumpets Yom Teruah is, never Rosh Hashanah, is the first day of the seventh month, not the first month. It sounds simple, should be simple, yet I know it's very hard for rabbis to figure out how to count. They really struggle with that, uh, especially when they practice Babylonian mystery religion, that's the real problem, and have nothing to do with the biblical one. And they don't, nor does the Catholic Church, and most churches don't know the Bible. Uh, they don't know the Bible calendar, and they are ridiculous in this. Never once does the Bible ever refer to the fall, nor Yom Teruah, as Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year, ever. Never does the Bible say the new year begins in the fall, ever. That is fraud, outright, and a disgusting show of it from illiterate occult rabbis especially today. A couple more things before we finish. Ezra the prophet, who was in his days, uh, he saw the restoration of the second temple, uh, as well as the law. Uh, this is how they practiced Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, at least part of the observance. Uh, he actually read to the people. Uh, remember, everyone did not have a scroll, and the originals in the temple were torched by the Edomites, Actually, according to Ezra, uh, those are the, the descendants of Esau, actually, uh, who assisted the Babylonians uh, in the destruction. In 1 Ezra 9.40, Ezra reads the entire law, all six books of Torah. Yes, Ezra used all six because he quotes the book of Jubilees. Yes, that would include the book of Jubilees, which tests as Torah, was kept and cataloged as Torah by the temple priest, in Qumran, who in their writing they call Torah. There you go. Written by Moses. Read that book if you have not, bookofjubilees.org. It's available uh, free in ebook there. Uh, and you, will f uh, you can also follow our 52-week series on that book as well. Talk about a test. 52 weeks, 52 videos testing it, uh, and an entire book. Uh, pretty thick. Far more valid than anyone else out there. Review it for yourself. And prove all things. Test it. One last quick thing. We already have a video on the Day of Atonement. Here it is on screen. Uh, we encourage everyone to review that as well. That's the next feast day uh, that occurs uh, you know, just about a week and a half later. Uh, it also proves the day begins at sunrise as this event begins in the evening, which is rare for scripture as it starts the Bible day at sunrise very clearly. Many times over we prove that. Uh, you will find the observance of this day begins on the 9th in the evening at sundown and ends sundown on the 10th day of the 7th month. The thing is, that proves the day changes at sunrise, never sunset. And yet many will actually cite that as an example of how the day supposedly starts at sunset. No, it doesn't. Watch that video for detail here in Acts 27.9. You can see, as this is the fast day of the year in Scripture, that is what the day's observance is about, uh, repentance and fasting. Uh, Luke affirms Paul practicing this very day right here. You will also find it is the shadow or foreshadow of the future day of judgment. We cover that in that video as well. Uh, when all the wicked are consumed and all sin is gone or atoned. And man, why would a New Testament church abandon and say the day of judgment practice passed away? Duh, it hasn't happened yet. For 2022, the Day of Atonement begins Thursday, uh, September 29th at sundown. Uh, atonement is always a sundown concept in Scripture, and that's why it begins in the evening. Uh, and it ends at sundown on the 30th. So it's the 29th and 30th, half day each, uh, for a total of 24 hours. Uh, this would be the 9th evening and the 10th daytime on the Hebrew calendar in the 7th month. Uh, 
Watch that video. This is the fast of the year when we seek repentance. It's only 24 hours, folks, and everyone can do this. I have faith in you. You can. Again, if you have a different date, keep the feast. That's what matters. So the day or feast of trumpets, Yom Teruah, never Rosh Hashanah, which is illiterate, takes place this year, 2022, on September 21st at sunrise. This is a Sabbath, but cooking is allowed as it is a feast Sabbath. Don't want to cook on the Sabbath? Don't. If you feel convicted, don't. That's okay. Uh, however, we uh, have always found it permissible to do so on a feast Sabbath, a food Sabbath. Uh, no work, though. Uh, food preparation is normal for the feast, uh, but you don't pay anyone to do it. Uh, no buying or selling, uh, so no catering uh, unless you get it uh, the day before, uh, and you can warm it up if needed. You could even do it uh, before sunrise, before 6 a.m. that day. It's still not uh, the 21st yet, uh, according to the Bible. Uh, the day has not begun. Uh, we usually plan a feast uh, late afternoon or early evening. Uh, here in the Philippines, uh, when we have a feast, it's usually we just eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. Um, <laughs> but we don't do any animal sacrifices, as we covered. Uh, they are not needed anymore. Yahushua is our sacrifice forever and always, once and for all. Scripture could not be more clear. But we gather together at least a small group. We blow horns, not necessarily the shofar, although that's cool if you have one and you can get a hold of one, great, uh, but not necessary. Uh, many begin at sunrise, which is appropriate. That's We actually should be blowing the trumpet at sunrise uh, and all day. <laughs> I know, it sounds like chaos. It doesn't have to be. You can have times set aside. We also, though, uh, read... Torah or law, as well as the future second coming of Messiah, which this represents. Uh, we don't necessarily read all six books of Torah, uh, but selected passages uh, throughout, uh, and we teach on this, and of course we, we certainly cover the end times accounts. Uh, this is a day where you can give your children horns as well, let them blast away within reason, of course. Uh, we offer incense, or biblical spices, if you will, like frankincense, myrrh, kamanyang in the Philippines, uh, and similar, as well as a drink offering or wine. Uh, again, this is one of the fun ones, for the kids especially. Make it a memory. They will entrench for the rest of their lives. Enjoy the celebration Yah bless my friends. We have almost 450 videos on this channel, one for every day of the year now. Many just as profound with some 50 or so in Tagalog for Filipinos, and now six in Spanish to start. We also have been setting up subtitles for 20 plus languages for most of our videos. Don't forget to like and subscribe and click the bell for notifications of new uploads. Join our email list though because, well, YouTube fails to notify often and we will notify you ourselves at thegodculture.com. Just fill in the pop-up there. We have uh, alternative platforms for videos on Rumble, Odyssey, and Utreon. And our podcast is also available for most of our videos. Uh, all links in the description box. And friend us on Facebook at The God Culture, space hyphen space, original. If you prefer an alternative, we now have Parlor and Gab. Links below. We have six books published internationally, being read in over 100 countries, with a new release now available, The First Book of Enoch, the oldest book in history, and we prove it is right in the introduction of the book. Read it. We also have now launched Ophir Philippines Coffee Table Book in the U.S., Canada, U.K., and many overseas markets on Amazon. It is a beautiful hardcover or softcover uh, on Amazon, coffee table book. It's hardcover in the Philippines only. Additionally, we launched the Book of Jubilees, the Torah calendar, with color maps and interior overseas as well, as many had requested. Uh, we already have the color maps in the Philippines for that. 
that too is available in hardcover color, softcover color, or even black and white still if you wish. The Book of uh, Enoch is available in the same three formats on Amazon overseas. However, in the Philippines, only black and white for the Book of Enoch. All books, including Solomon's Treasure, are now free in ebook. Yes, folks, our content is free. Just go to ophirinstitute.com for all the links for your area for all of our books. More coming soon. Thank you for watching. Now, always remember prove all things for yourself. Yah bless to everyone.